You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Hey, everybody. This is Maxine Taylor with another edition of Move Into the Magic. And I am so excited once again to introduce to you uh, my dear friend, Roberta Grimes, um, who is an internationally recognized expert on the afterlife. And those of you who have listened to my previous interviews with her, you know how learned she is, you know how sincere she is, and you know how filled with joy she is because of the information she is sharing with the world in her books, which have taken off like wildfire. First of all, Roberta Grimes is an Austin-based business attorney. Now, this might be the last person you would expect to be um, an internationally recognized uh, authority on the afterlife, on what happens when we leave uh, the earth plane. When she was a child, she had two extraordinary experiences of light, as a result of which she spent decades studying nearly 200 years of abundant and consistent communications from the dead. And when we say dead, that's our earthbound definition of it. She used this material plus the principles of quantum mechanics and the latest developments in consciousness research and was eventually able to figure out what those two experiences were when she was a child. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time giving you her background because she will share so much information um, with you that I know many of you have been waiting for. I will mention to you, though, that she is a graduate of Smith College and Boston University School of Law. Now, you can reach Roberta at robertagrimes.com. And I'm giving you this information now because once Roberta and I get started, it's hard for us to stop. If you've listened to her previous shows with me, you know that we are like two girlfriends just chatting and talking and laughing and filled with joy over all of her books. And we're only going to speak today about her latest two books, or I should say her two latest books. The one that is absolutely going to blow the lid off of everything it just came out is called Liberating Jesus, and I'm going to let her tell you about that one, as well as a beautiful book that is hot off the press called Flying High in Spirit, a young snowboarder's account of his ride through heaven. And so, without further ado, Roberta Grimes, welcome once again to Move Into the Magic. Maxine, I'm so happy to be with you. I, I, I love to hear you talk. Oh, thank you. And I love to hear you talk. <laughs> well, I, I think that we have to give a little background on liberating Jesus. I have been a really intense Christian my whole life long, because when I was eight years old, I woke up in the middle of the night and I basically forgot that there's a God. I was really scared. So there was a bright white light in the room, just a flash of light. And a young male voice said, you wouldn't know what it is to have me if you didn't know what it is to be without me. I will never leave you again. Now, when you're eight, nothing surprises you. Everything seems normal, has to be normal, right? I thought, it's handy. If you forget there's a God, they remind you and went back to sleep. But I feel as if... That just happened last night. It's in, the, it's in the nature of these extraordinary experiences that they never leave your mind. That was 60 years ago. It feels like it just happened. I never told anybody what had happened to me. Never ask a question. You're never going to get an answer. That's why I majored in religion at Smith. I wanted to find out what that was. But never ask a question. Never get an answer. So I figured it had to have come from wherever the dead are. And that's what made me do all of this research. I spent decades as a very disciplined researcher trying to understand what happens at and after death. And what I discovered is it's not hard. You just got to spend the time to find the evidence because it's the, all the evidence is perfectly consistent across decades and really across almost 200 years 
and, and there is consistent scientific support. Everything is just perfect. Now, at the same time I was doing that, of course, I was practicing the most zealous possible version of Christianity. I was a, a Protestant. I married a Catholic. I became a zealous Catholic. And I was reading the Bible through cover to cover over and over again. So I had a crisis when I was in my 50s because one of the things I was eager to find was all the wonderful evidence there would be that the things I had believed as a Christian were true. And in reality, what I discovered is there's not a blessed bit of evidence anywhere you look that God ever has judged or any religious figure ever has judged anyone. In fact, we judge ourselves, which is something Jesus tells us in the Gospels, but we ignore. There was no evidence that the death of Jesus on the cross ever made a difference in anybody's life or death. Not necessary to redeem when God doesn't judge. There was no um, evidence for a, a strong figure in opposition to God, no evidence for a fiery hell. There's basically no, no evidence you have to be a Christian to get into heaven. What counts when you die is that you've lived in accordance with the teachings of Jesus. And you can do that if you've never learned them, because it's just learn to perfectly love, learn to perfectly forgive and practice it in your life. And you go right to the head of the line. But if you haven't done those things, having accepted Jesus as your savior does nothing for you. Now, this was hard for me to accept because I tied it in my mind to Jesus and I love Jesus. So I stopped reading the Bible then. I didn't read it for years. And then one day I, I kept thinking, you know, I think he told us some of this stuff. I but I just I, I don't want to test him. I can't test the Lord. But one day it felt like a whim. I dusted off my Bible. I started in reading the red letters in the gospels, and that was the most joyous time of my entire life. And I've got children, grandchildren, I've been married 43 years. The high point of my life was when I discovered that 2,000 years ago, Jesus told us things about God, reality, death, the afterlife, and the meaning and purpose of human life that we could not have in any manner verified until the 20th century. Now, what does that tell us, Maxine? I can prove Jesus is real. Here's corroboration. And Jesus also helps us prove that the afterlife evidence is real. This is so extraordinary. It's a miracle from God. Wow, it, it really is. Uh, and the thing that blew me away when I was reading Liberating Jesus was that Christians are wrong in building their religion around the whole Christian Bible. Yes. And Please Jesus says that it. too. Jesus says all of that. This is the part... When you read the Gospels by themselves, you find that Jesus never meant what we call the Old Testament to be part of his scripture. Nobody who reads the Bible from cover to cover can possibly believe it's all the inspired word of God because it's full of internal contradictions. Yes. And many of those contradictions are Old Testament teachings and beliefs, which are directly contradictory to what Jesus told us. You can't hold black and white simultaneously in your mind as, as the same thing. You can't do it. I mean, the word of God has to be consistent if it's anything. Wouldn't you think? I would. <laughs> I would. Yes. And in, in all the, the years that I've read the Bible, I, what I wound up saying to all of my students is for every pro, there's a con. Yeah. Yeah. If, it's For every yes, there's a no. I mean, the fact is Jesus told us, to throw away what they called at that time the law and the prophets because he had fulfilled the law and the prophets. It's in the Gospels. Jesus, of course, never would have known anything about the rest of the New Testament. And for anyone who's not familiar with the Christian Bible, it's pretty simple. It's 66 books, but only four of them contain the words of Jesus. Most of the Christian Bible is what we call the Old Testament, but the Jews of his day called the Law and the Prophets. They're, it's ancient Hebrew scripture. Following the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the rest of the New Testament is the letters of Paul, 
and other writings of, of very early people who were building a religion. Um, the book of Revelation, we probably should mention, is the ravings of a nutcase. There's <laughs> nothing, nothing. I mean, I think he was driven insane by persecution. There's no other explanation. But there is nothing in the book of Revelation that has anything to do with Jesus, with God, or with anything good. So throw that one away for sure. People ask me about that. Well, but it says don't change this. Well, yeah, if I were writing something that was insane, I'd say you better not change this crazy thing I just wrote. <laughs> but, but in point of fact, we do tremendous harm when we call all of that equal to the, to the divine words of Jesus because the gospels truly are divinely inspired. They are the word of God. And that's the part. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's real. The rest of it was put together by a series of councils, the Council of Nicaea being the most famous. Yes. And they just put it together. And then they told us, hey, this is the inspired word of God. Where did they hear that this was the inspired word of God? Did God speak to them? No. They decided to call it the inspired word of God. We have no other evidence that that was anything except what these people were doing to, to create a religion. Not only did they mush together these books that don't agree or make sense, but they also altered the Gospels. I think that's unforgivable although we're supposed to forgive. We can forgive that too, but at least now we know how to fix them. You can easily pull out what they added, and you kind of have to. If you care about the truth, Jesus said, if you, if you hold to my teachings, listen, this is very important. If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's on the front of liberating Jesus. It's John 8, 31 to 32. Jesus said that. Why don't we listen to him? If we call ourselves followers of Jesus, it seems to be the most basic thing for us to do is to listen to Jesus and, as I sp and, and follow him. I mean, take him seriously. And you can't do that if you're inside one of the traditional Christian denominations. It's not possible. There are so many reasons why it's not possible. One is that they buy the whole of this mashed together series of scriptures, which Jesus himself repudiates right in the Gospels. That's a problem for people who, who want to call the whole uh, Bible the inspired word of God. But also, the dogmas of Christianity teach us to fear God. And you cannot love what you fear. The primary, primary command of God is love. That's all that God asks of us is love, and we can't love him, and therefore we probably cannot even love our fellow man until we have stopped practicing a religion that teaches us to fear. That's why I had to, st I mean, I loved being a Christian. I can sing all the hymns, and you know, the fellowship and the, the ritual. I just loved it. But the trouble was that I, until I stopped practicing Christianity, I couldn't get past fearing God. I couldn't approach God as Jesus tells us to approach God. Go into a room, close the door, and speak to, the, to your father who is in secret. And your father, who sees what's in secret, will reward you. Couldn't do that when I was a Christian. And other people now, I'm hearing from so many people who are just finding this book, and they're saying the same thing. They're saying, some people say, I always believed this. Why didn't anybody say it sooner? Or other people say, you know, I was raised, I, I got a, a my, my most recent blog post is by a, a, a magnificent man. He writes much better than I ever could. And he talked about his long journey out of a, a very strict Pentecostal um, religion, how little by little he had to get rid of the notion, which is from the Old Testament, that the earth was created in six days. And he said in the end, what he came to understand is that the God that's true, the God of Jesus, is much greater than the God that he had been, been he said, yeah, you could, you could make something in six days, but to make the whole universe and have it work perfectly, to, to, to be the genuine God is much bigger than to be the Christian God. So <laughs> that's what liberating Jesus is. It's an analysis of what's 
true based in what the Lord tells us, not based in what any religion tells us. None of the religions have it right. I'm with you on that. I noticed in the book, uh, the one of the parts that I adored was when you described the two principles that Jesus tells us to live by, to love God and to love our neighbor as ourself. Yes. But you really explain it on a much more esoteric, much more spiritual, much truer level. Will you explain that? Well, I think that's an important passage for a couple of reasons. Um, and I'll give you both of them. The first is, this is how Jesus told us to throw away the law and the prophets. When someone, and remember, Jesus, the whole time he was teaching, he was, he had a death sentence over his head because to speak against the prevailing religion would get you killed pretty fast. So he had to tell the truth in ways that wouldn't make him run afoul of the temple guards that were always with him. So his, his followers followed him from place to place. The temple guards would change and therefore over days he would give them truths. Uh, he didn't give them all the, the truth all at once. So one day someone said, well, teacher, are you, are you really abolishing the law and the prophets? And he said, no, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Okay, what does he mean by that? Different day, different guards. Someone said, master, what is the greatest commandment? Now, there are 10 commandments. He was thinking of the 10. Jesus didn't mention any of the 10. What he said was what you just quoted. And this is the greatest passage, I think, in all of any writing in any language. It, this is big. He says, the greatest command is that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it. You will love your neighbor as yourself. Then he says, in that consists all the law and the prophets. So do you see what he's done? First, he's given us two new commandments. These aren't any of the 10. And they're just love. Love God perfectly. Love your neighbor perfectly. And then he says, that's all the whole law and the prophets. Get rid of that. When I said I came to fulfill it, I mean, you don't need it anymore. It's right in the Gospels. So that's the first important thing about what you just said the second is and you when people read this they think he is sort of saying love your neighbor as if he were yourself but that's not what he ever says i've never found that in any translation of the gospels instead he says love your neighbor as yourself and the reason he says it that way is we who have studied the afterlife evidence have discovered that our minds are eternal they're parts of the genuine eternal god and therefore we're all part of each other there is only one of us here love your neighbor as yourself because he is and she is yourself I love that. Isn't um, that beautiful? <laughs> oh man, I, it is beautiful. Now I have to, I have to ask you something else. <sighs> so many Christians were taught that God is a, a God is a guy in the sky. A guy in the sky. <laughs> and I, I like to say he's a guy in the sky who sent his kid down to die. <gasps> yes. And my question uh, for years the way I've studied <clears throat> and what I've learned is source energy, the zero point field, spirit, divinity, love is neither a boy nor a girl. No, what, what the dead tell us, and I think it's important to understand that they have a much better perspective on everything than we do. Um, they live in what is 90, probably 95% of reality. We live in a little 5%, and we have very little access to our minds when we're here. Um, most of our minds are, are um, as Mikey in his book says, it's as if we pack our, most of our minds in a suitcase and leave it there so we can come here and have some adventures. Well, in point of fact, we have, because with the help of science and with the help of uh, the dead, we've discovered what God is. No religion is in any way related to God. Religions are all man-made. 
Jesus tells us that in the Gospels and everyone, Jesus came to abolish religions, to teach us to relate to God directly and on our own. His early followers had no clue what he was saying, but we who read a modern uh, edition of the uh, Gospels can see it very clearly. He was trying to get rid of religions so, because we don't need them. Now, not only are they a crutch, but they're, they're basically an evil crutch. Um, I, I, they teach us to, I mean, how scary is this? God as this poor fellow who wrote this blog post that I, I, I guess post, as he said, when he was a child, he would cry himself to sleep. Why does God hate me so much? And then he would feel so bad for Jesus that he was so awful that God, that Jesus had to die for his sins. And the only way God could accept him was if he was covered in Jesus's blood. And that made him feel filthy. Now, this is a little boy. Yeah. We're teaching this to a child. Yes. And, and that's what they do. That is one scary and repellent God. A God that is so petty that because he got cranky about Adam and Eve, he, we, he considers he still blames us for whatever Adam and Eve did. And there's no way he can forgive us unless he gets to watch the murder of his own child. Now, why? Why does Christianity teach things which are so awful? It's easy to understand why. In the first century AD, they were still sacrificing animals in their temples. And of course, Adam and Eve's story was very fresh relatively to them. That's in the Old Testament. And they, they decided what must have happened. Because here's a terrible thing that suddenly was inflicted on them, the death of their Messiah. He had just finished doing all this teaching. They were sure he was the real deal. And then he was murdered. What did it mean? Well, Paul, a first century man, had first century ideas about what it meant. Because they had to keep sacrificing animals, uh, that God probably took pity on us. And he gave us a perfect sacrifice. If we sacrifice Jesus, which just happened, then all we have to do is claim his sacrifice and we don't have to sacrifice pigeons anymore. That's where it came from. It made perfect sense. 2,000 years ago. Mm. Why does it make sense today to a single human being? Mm. That's not love. There's no loving God that would, would want to see anybody murdered, never mind his own child. I, I, when I've, people have argued with me about this, and I've said, well, how many children do you have? Oh, four. All right, they're small. Um, all right, which of them would you most enjoy watching be horribly murdered so you'd feel better about forgiving the rest of them that they messed up the living room? And people are appalled when I say that. But that's exactly what we assume is true of God, that God would do that. Right. We are not more loving and forgiving than God, not even close. So it's time to rethink what, what certainly for many hundreds of years could have made sense to nobody alive. When I've asked priests about this, they say it's a sacred mystery. Well, enough with the sacred mysteries. They cause tremendous harm to little children who cry themselves to sleep because God doesn't love them. What a horrible thing to teach our children. Jesus tells us in the Gospels what to teach the children. From their earliest infancy, they need to be taught that they are perfectly loved by an infinitely loving God. They are the most precious, precious child of this infinitely loving God. And they're here to learn to love more perfectly and forgive more completely. That's it. And here's how you do it, children. And then we can have lessons in learning more perfect love and forgiveness that the children can take and little games they can play. That's what we should be teaching the children. So is this why you let go of Christianity and embraced Jesus? You cannot be a follower of Jesus and remain inside any Christian denomination of which I am aware. You can't do both because the Christian teachings not only are not true, we can prove they're not true because of the afterlife evidence and what it tells us about what actually happens at and after death. But not only are they not true, but they teach us to fear God. The primary, remember what, what was that number one, one rule? Love God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You can't do that and be a Christian. 
because you are afraid of God. Love and fear are the true opposites. And until you can get rid of that, and I tried to get rid of it and stay a Christian. I mean, I love my husband. He still goes to mass. I tried to go with him for a long time. There were two problems. The first was that it always made me afraid of God to do it. But also, above the altar in every Catholic church that we have attended in the last 20 years, there's been a life-size, full-color, plaster Jesus bleeding on a cross above the altar. That's horrible. Why is it there? It's there to make you feel really, really guilty, like that little child, that you're so bad that Jesus had to go through that hell for you. To begin with, I'm pretty confident that the reason that Jesus died was because he needed to prove to us our lives are eternal. And how, how else can you do it? When we're talking Iron Age primitives, and he's trying to say, Life goes on, life goes on. They they know better. They see people decay and and disappear, and they never hear from them again. So what he did was he went through a very public execution for us. He did that for us so that in a few days, he could reanimate that body and go, ta-da! Now do you get it? Life is eternal. I'm not dead. Don't you see that? That's why he did it. But let's forgive, finally, let's forgive Paul. Paul did us a wonderful service. He preserved those teachings. If he hadn't created Christianity, as the first century Jewish sect it still is, if he hadn't done that, we wouldn't have these teachings. We wouldn't be able to compare the teachings with what God has just told us about the afterlife and confirm it. Because what we're really seeing is a genuine miracle from God. This is a new revelation. Why do I say that? I always wondered as I was doing all this research, we got a flood, starting in the early 20th century, we got a flood of very good communications from the dead, mostly through deep transmediums. I mean, they were detailed, and there were many, hundreds of them received in Great Britain and also in the United States, in the eastern United States. Why all of a sudden? They were trying to prove to us, the the teams of the dead said at the time, they were trying to prove that they were real. Didn't, the scientists didn't take it seriously. But there are books and books of these interviews, basically with dead people through deep trans mediums. I've read hundreds of them. They are all perfectly consistent across time, across space. They talk about the same physics, the same process, the same pastimes there, the same, just the same everything. It's as if they all went to some very complex place and they had different experiences, but the rules are all the same. So that's why I knew that, that the afterlife was real. We also have modern translations of the Bible. Now, many people may not know that the Bible went through two translations. Jesus spoke Aramaic. Those words were translated into Greek. The Greek was translated into the modern languages. If you you look at a modern two-step translation into English, I haven't checked the other languages because I only speak English, but I hope other people will. But if if you compare what the dead tell us with what Jesus says, 2,000 years later, in a modern two-step translation, the match is perfect. Once you get rid of the bits of coal and garbage, there, that are, it's, they're obviously are extraneous because they're inconsistent with the rest of the Gospels, and you just compare his teachings on love and forgiveness and the meaning and purpose of human life and the nature of God, the important things, perfect match. If you look at a translation from Aramaic to English, not a good match. So here's the miracle. Jesus is trying to tell us one more time what's really going on. He's saying, use the canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Forget about even the other Gospels. Just compare what I've just given you about what the afterlife is like with what I've just given you in a modern English translation. Match! There's no way that could not be the case. Uh, that, that, That could be the case if that were not a genuine revelation from God. Not possible. And you know, Roberta, in all of your books that I've interviewed you on, uh, starting with The Fun of Dying, the information that you've been given on the afterlife is what people really are hungering for, 
They and, are hungry for it. And, and of course, I always recommend to all my friends so they get a copy of The Fun of Dying because it is just so filled with beautiful information. And then your latest book, Flying High in Spirit, uh, uh, which is just the most beautiful story, uh, has information in it that ties in magnificently with everything that you have already written. Um, and, and so since we're talking about what goes on on the, the other side when you leave, let's move, just slide perfectly naturally into flying high in spirit. Tell us, I read this book on the plane coming back <laughs> from Las Vegas, um, and it was such a delightful, beautiful story. Um, tell us about this book, how it came to be, and who Mikey is, um, and, and what he says about the other side. Well, I, when I, in 2011, I met a, a grieving mother. Her son had died four years earlier, and le less than four years at the time I met her, and she had just learned to communicate with him by pendulum. And she was telling me he was a sixth level being. Now that's right below the level of the source. I didn't believe in pendulum communication, and I for sure didn't believe that her son was this big shot. It took me, it took me years to become convinced. I've seen Mikey answer hundreds of questions. He's never made a mistake. And very often he'll say what I know to be true, and then he'll say something a little extra, which I know is perhaps true. So he's teaching me things. This kid who died at the age of 20. Well, it turns out that Mikey last lived in the 1600s. And I'm, all of this I'm certain about now. There's no doubt in my mind whatsoever, or I would not have helped them write this book. He last lived in the 1600s. But what's going on now, and everybody who has eyes to see can see it, is that those at the highest level of reality are so concerned about us that they're working to raise the consciousness of the planet. That's why Jesus is giving us a new revelation, which, which is expressed in Liberating Jesus. That's why Mikey took a little short 20-year lifetime here because somebody from the 1600s who's been for 400 years in the afterlife couldn't talk to us very well. Any communication from an upper-level being that we've ever gotten has been stilted and strange. They don't, they don't know what it's like to be human. So he came back just to refamiliarize himself with what it was to be human and then died young so that he could communicate through his mother. And she swears she wouldn't have signed up for it, but yes, she did. He insists she did. This is a deal they made before either of them was born. So Mikey wanted to write his autobiography. I became convinced he was real. I said, all right, I'll help you do it. And over the same period when I was suddenly finding myself writing Liberating Jesus, I was helping Mikey write his book. I didn't plan this. Clearly they did. But both books came out October 1st of this year. Both of them, the last time I looked, um, had... Um, were extremely well rated on Amazon, and both of them were had been bought by all the major chains before Christmas. You should be able to find them in Barnes and Noble, Costco, Target, Books a Million, and the Hudson Airport stores. After Christmas, and also by the way, apparently before Christmas, they'll be for sale in the United Arab Emirates. I don't, I don't know why, and also Waterstones in in. Um, the, in the United Kingdom. After Christmas, Walmart, Kmart, Sam's, CVS, and Walgreens. That's what I know about. They aren't, I don't think they tell me all the sales they're making, but the, the publisher is rather amazed about this too. Obviously, obviously, my guide and, and Mikey are working together and they're planning they're planning the sales. It really doesn't have much to do with us at this point. Yeah. <laughs> but if I was, if I was doubting and I, it's hard not to doubt because this is such a major thing to say, to say Christianity is bogus. Everybody get a clue. You either follow Jesus or you follow Paul. That was really terrible, terribly troubling to me. But if I ever doubted watching the sales uh, has taken away my doubt. Um, this is something which, we have to do in order to save the world. 
It turns out, and this all started in my life when my primary spirit guide broke into my daytime life. We all have spirit guides, by the way, and I really recommend that people get in touch with theirs because we're all in close touch during the night, but we just don't usually remember those, those encounters. But I wasn't doing what he wanted me to do. I had done the research which he wanted me to do. I had written Fun of Dying, Fun of Staying in Touch, no problem at all. Then he wanted me to write a book about Jesus. No way was I going to write a book about Jesus. So he broke into my daytime life, which is against, I think, the union rules for spirit guides. I'm not sure if he's in trouble or not, but he had to have this book written. And um, he, he told me that he had been Thomas Jefferson, and we know Thomas Jefferson was a very big, um, uh, had a very big interest in the Gospels. He did the Jefferson Bible, which is uh, an editing of the Gospels. He was a very spiritual man. Many people don't know that. And he had written, apparently, an early version of Liberating Jesus, but not published it. But he said, now it has to be published because the corrupting of the master's teachings is a major reason why the world is going to hell. And if we do not, do not liberate Jesus and let him teach us freshly what is the truth, the world apparently is going to, uh, within about 200 years, end up in a climactic religious war started by Christians. That's what Thomas says. And that's why I wrote Liberating Jesus. I didn't have a choice. He insisted. But as I say, I was uneasy about it until people started reading it and telling me how it was affecting them. And I said, okay, I guess Thomas knows what he's doing, even if I may not know really what I'm doing or have a clue. And so that's how he got to be here. But Thomas says this is a serious situation. Uh, the fact that Jesus really has never been followed. His intention 2,000 years ago was to, was to free us from superstitions and teach us how to relate to God and teach us the meaning and purpose of human life. But it wasn't done. It's never been done by churches. Here I was, the most zealous Christian on earth. And I didn't understand why I was here until I started doing the afterlife research and the dead tell us that this is a school. This is basically kindergarten for loving and forgiving. We've got to learn those basic lessons or else we cannot progress spiritually. That's the way it is. Well, in this delightful book, uh, the picture that uh, you have shared with us of Mikey. Uh, oh, yes, back to my, I'm sorry, I get all wrapped up in liberating Jesus. Mikey is a genuine advanced being. He now shows up whenever I, I, because now I talk to Thomas through a medium and he shows up too. And he shows up as a ball of blue light because he is so advanced. He usually doesn't even bother to put on a body. That's, that's very advanced, but he talks like a 20 year old kid, which to me is so delightful Mike, uh, Carol says he sounds in the book exactly the way he sounded when he was here. The same expressions, the same, the sa it's the same voice. Now, Carol is his mother, correct? Mother, that's right. And he apparently was quite uh, a remarkable child. Uh, incredibly happy. Uh, how would you describe him? He did sound quite unique. He, 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 yes. Very advanced children. Um, I should just add to people who have lost a child, the evidence is very strong that everybody who dies as a subadult, as Mikey did, is a very advanced being who didn't need that whole lifetime. And they come to be with us briefly and give us the gift of, of losing a child temporarily because that helps us to grow spiritually. I know it's not, not all gifts are fun to receive and that's one that's certainly not, but it's very helpful spiritually for the parents. And the same is true with Mikey. He had all the signs. I mean, he, he's sweet, he's mild, he's gentle with his family. Um, he, he apparently was very popular with other kids. And if there was somebody who was not, uh, you know, was mean to him, he would simply withdraw. You know, he doesn't. He didn't have any of the aggressions or the the negative things that we tend to think of as typical of rambunctious boys. But he loved snowboarding. He got into it and he loved it. That's why he even went to to uh, school to college at CSU in Fort Collins, Colorado, so he could snowboard every chance he got. 
And what happened was he was killed in an uh, accident in the, uh, a very freak accident in the Rockies in September of 2007. But my, what he does to this day is to snowboard. He says that the mountains in the mid-level, the mid-levels of the afterlife are much better than the mountains here. They have half pipes that are better. I don't know what that is. They have tables that are better. No idea what that is. But he talks snowboarding talk to kids. He says he's so excited to have his friends come and see how well he's better than Sean White. And he says the best thing about it is that, A, you're not cold because the snow feels cold because you remember snow is cold. But the temperature there isn't cold but also you can fall and you don't get hurt he was always getting hurt snowboarding and and so you just uh, you just apparently have fun well i think what parents would love to know is about the communion the continued communion uh between our plane and the other side, because our loved ones, apparently from from uh, my own investigations and of course your uh, investigations, which far exceed and surpass mine, tell us that those on the other side are always trying to get in touch with us. Yes, yes. And, and we don't listen. Well, because we don't know what to look for. The fun of staying in touch um, shows people what to look for. And Flying high in spirit, um, some people have said to that that to them the most enjoyable part was watching Mikey trying to get through to his face. Because first he had to reestablish contact with his family in order for him to even work with his mother. And so we, we get to see what he does, how he does it. And uh, frankly, he was one of my technical experts when I wrote The Fun of Staying in Touch. And I quote him in that book. How, you know, how do you do this? How do you do that? He explains how these signs are done. But it's true that everybody, well, first, we need to understand all the levels of the afterlife and are in the same place we are. Everything is energy, including what we think of as the material level of reality. It's all here. So dying is just a simple matter. Right now, you're tuned to that body on this level of reality, and that's why you think you're in it. And your mind, if you think of it as a TV set, your mind will just tune to a slightly higher channel, and you'll pick up a whole new solid reality. When you die, it's so easy. So your loved ones are all around you, and they're trying to get your attention, but it's so, we, we say, oh, it's a coincidence. You know, yes, that's the same song. Uh, that was his favorite song, and it keeps playing on the radio, but it's a coincidence. Well, it's not a coincidence, obviously, that the odds against chance for something like that are incalculable. My mother, I mean, one of the things that Mikey uses is insects. He uses dragonflies. And my mother, right after she died, gave me a backyard in August in Austin full of dragonflies for a whole afternoon. The next day, it was full of butterflies. Nowhere else were these insects anywhere in the town. But a whole, a whole afternoon of thousands of butterflies. The next day, dragonflies again. That's impossible to have that happen if, if it's not in a, a dead person doing it. I went out on my deck the fourth day thinking, well, what is it going to be butterflies? What are you going to do now, Mom? And a butterfly and a dragonfly flew side by side right in front of my face. And that's it. I never saw another insect the whole blasted summer. Wow. That's the kind of thing they enjoy doing. And one of the things Mikey is doing now is teaching um, – Teaching, teaching people who have just died how to do these signs. But we who are here need to remember that they aren't going to keep doing them for long. So it's very important to know what the signs are. And insects are a big one. Songs on the radio are a big one. Um, a, a, a very big one is sense. To, to smell a familiar a scent that reminds you of someone. My brother-in-law gave me a gag of cigarette smoke when I first entered his house after his death. He was never allowed to smoke in the house, but, uh, but I got one big whiff of cigarette smoke. Um, and, of course, pennies and feathers are very, and other small objects. Uh, they call them apports. They're, they're very common signs, but people need to know them. And every time you see a sign from someone that you love, uh, or maybe it's a sign, I don't know for sure. Always say, thank you, I see it, do it again. And say it aloud. Speaking aloud to the dead is important. Even though they can hear your thoughts, speak aloud. 
And in Mikey's case, um, it's been eight years now as we speak since he died, and he is still every day giving his mother signs. Um, give, he often gives her songs, um, and some of the signs he gives are kind of weird and amazing and spectacular. But he talks about some of that in the book and how he does them too, which I think is kind of fun. Well, he has help apparently from some of his buddies yes. on the yes. other side. <laughs> yes, he and his buddies get together and use their combined energies to, I mean, there's a, there's a picture in the book of a, uh, um, a rainbow that he made for his brother Joey when his brother Joey went back to Mikey's favorite snowboarding mountain. That rainbow was produced by several um, dead people working together. Yes, and that, that lasted for three hours or something. Uh, oh, it, as we know, rainbows are ephemeral. Well, they made one that stayed there for hours. Oh, I just love it. You know, um, last time I was in a funeral, well, not last time, a recent time when I was in a funeral home, um, we, a bunch of us were sitting together and a dear friend of ours had uh, made her transition. Um, and usually uh, when I'm contacted um the front of my face starts tingling it it itches it tingles oh, isn't it that tingles. interesting yes this time it was the back of my head i kept scratching my head and kept scratching my head until finally i realized oh it's my girlfriend it's it's my dear yeah. friend once i recognized that it stopped yes yeah and Thanks. i shared it with another one of my girlfriends who was there and said did you feel her and she said, no, she didn't. And I thought, well, maybe she just came to me because she knew that yes. I would be able to feel her. Right. Yeah. And it's, they want so much to be in touch with us. They love us just as much. And they're the same people they were before they transitioned. And it feels to them that they're right here with us. So to be ignored is really sad. They don't want to be ignored. Oh, I wouldn't want to be ignored either. And my understanding, and you'll have to really corroborate this, is that past the sixth level, <clears throat> that we won't hear from them anymore. They are beyond our reach. People need to know the lowest level is what Jesus called the outer darkness. It's a punishment level, but the only people who will put us there are ourselves. Above that is like a recovery level. People have called it purgatory. Um, and we can get out of there, but not as easily uh, as, as the Summerland, which is levels three through five. Beautiful, earth solid, where most of us will be. We most, seemed most of us, even Mikey entered at the third level. Um, that's, there's a reception garden. There's all kinds of wonderful stuff there. So that's up through the fifth level. The sixth level is extremely advanced. Jesus called it the kingdom of heaven. That's where the most advanced people who have still not rejoined the source are. And it's full of universities. It's, it's full of people who are serving on this level and in the afterlife, serving, teaching, helping. And that's how they grow spiritually at that point. They don't usually incarnate, which is what, what Mikey did was so remarkable. The, the seventh level is the, we, we call it the celestial level or the source level. Mikey has taught me a lot because I've never known anybody who was as advanced as he is. And I, many of us have thought that that's it. You merge with, in fact, they used to call it the second death. You merge with God and you aren't there anymore. Mikey says, no, we keep our identities and the seventh level is not the top. There is no top. We will grow forever, which I think is wonderful every bit of information i get about the afterlife is even better than what i already knew i mean think of that your growth is eternal you can yes. become more and more perfect yes it's very exciting it is exciting i mean i can't think of anything more more wonderful because people people are so afraid of death they are afraid yes and I think it's because of this belief that we have been, uh, that's been foistered on us of hell, damnation, and the devil, the fact that we are sinners, um, and the fact that only, there's only one way to get to heaven, which you know couldn't possibly be true, and to overcome the fear of death 
I think is the greatest freedom anybody can have. Oh, and this is what you're supposed to do. Yes, yes. And, and that, I think, is the primary reason all of this is happening now. It cripples us spiritually to such an extent to be afraid of death, to be afraid of God. When, when that fear goes and you know that you are the best beloved child of an infinitely powerful God, each person listening is that. I mean, think of your toddler. Is there anything your toddler could do that would make you love him any less? No, his little cute mistakes make you love him more. Well, that's how God feels about us. There's nothing you could do to separate yourself from the infinite love of God. And when you really know that, as you say, nothing could make you happier than to know that you and everybody you love is alive and happy and joyous forever in a perfect, perfect place where God does nothing but love us. That's the truth. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Oh, does it ever. And the signs, as you have said, are all around us all the time. Whether through dreams. A lot of people have quite prophetic dreams. Yes. Yes. Um, Dreams. And, but it's important too, Maxine, for people to understand that when, when enough people know the truth, all the things we we dread, all the things we worry about, the, the you know wars and 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 um, terrorism, and all those things, they're all going to go away. When enough people know the truth, the world will be set free, and that's a reason for everybody to begin to really. It's our job. We've got to educate ourselves about what's true, and then love it and live it, and share it with everybody we can find. And that's what's that's what's. Is life a tragedy or a comedy? Life is joy. It's pure joy. Everybody needs to know that. The world will change. I agree. And that's why I think your books are so wonderful because they're so uplifting. And every time somebody sees you or hears your voice, your joy is so palpable and contagious. (laughs) And, And this is why I love having you on because... What you're sharing with us is the good news. This it's is the, the good, good news. news. That this is the that true good news. Uh-huh. This is the revelation from God that we are infinitely loved. Nothing can ever harm us. Life is eternal. There is absolutely nothing to fear. That's the truth. And, yes. and once we all believe it, think of the world we're going to have. The world will be made new. So let's begin that now. Let's begin it today. I think that's a wonderful thought because, you know, a lot of people I know want to get over their fear of death. They want to believe yes. uh, what, what we're, you and I are talking about. And so I think the greatest um, gift you can give yourself if you're listening to Roberta right now is to ask the universe, ask the multiverse, ask God to uh, show you how you personally can overcome your fear of death. Because when you do, all you're going to do is laugh. Yes, that's I, I, right. That's it. That's, there's nothing that ever can make you sad. If people who are listening are worried about, because they're Christian and they've been told not to do this or do that. All I ask is you, that you buy a red letter modern Bible that, pr- that prints the words of Jesus in red letters and sit down and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read the red letters on love and forgiveness. That's all. Let Jesus speak to you. Because if you love Jesus as I love Jesus, that's all you're going to want to hear from now on is the words of the Lord. Roberta, what a beautiful note on which to close this particular session. There will be more. Um, So thank you again, uh, dear friend, for being my guest this evening. And I want to invite you, of course, anytime to come back. And I want to invite all of our listeners to join us again when next time we move into the magic. And I want to leave you all with one thought that if you want to change your life, change your mind, because when you change